Good afternoon from Madrid. My name is David Henneberger. I'm the project director for Spain, Italy, and Portugal here in Madrid for Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom. Sorry about this little delay. Um, this is a highly academic panel, so this is cum de bore, I guess. <laughs> and now we have everything settled and uh, we are ready to start. Friedrich Naumann Foundation is the German Liberal Foundation with ties to the German Liberal Party, FDP. And we are currently working in over 60 countries around the world promoting important topics such as human rights, the rule of law, the market economy, and so on. Thank you so much again for joining us. And thank you, of course, um, to Luis Garricano and Andres Velasco. It's an honor to have you, gentlemen. Thank you for taking um, time to, to be here with uh, us this afternoon. These are truly remarkable times. Um, we are facing the biggest health crisis since the Spanish flu and subsequently probably also the deepest recession in a hundred years. We have restraints on civil liberties around the world. Um, we have disrupted supply chains, which will probably never be the same again. And all of this while we are confronted with a dangerous lack of leadership international and also with a lack of trust in international relations. And this is exactly why Tony Roldan from Asada Equal and we at FNF Madrid joined forces to start asking some important questions that have to be raised um, uh, against the background of the circumstances that I have just mentioned. Tony holds many degrees. I'm just going to mention two. He holds a degree in um, economics from the Autonomous University uh, of Barcelona and another one in political economy from Columbia University. He was also a spokesperson on the economy for Ciudadanos here uh, in Spain in the Spanish Congress when he was an MP. And uh, that was before he founded the Sada Equal a think tank within the framework of Asada Business School, a partner of ours here in Madrid. Tony, thank you so much for this cooperation. And again, also to Andres and Luis and for, to everyone watching us. Let's have a great afternoon. Thank you very much, David. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks very much for uh, pushing for that initiative. And thanks so much, uh, Luis and Andres, uh, for joining us today. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me. Uh, those two uh, professors you see in the screen are uh, two big references for me. Uh, I've been lucky enough to have them both as professors. Uh, one, uh, Andres, in New York at Columbia University and Luis uh, at LSE. Um, uh, both are absolute references in their, in their fields as professors of economics. And they have the great advantage that they decided to be brave and, and move also towards the political terrain. Uh, Andres was a uh, finance minister in Chile. He also ran for president <laughs> recently. Uh, and now he's the dean of the School of Public Policy at the LSE. Uh, thank you very much, Andres, for joining us today. Um, and Luis uh, is a professor, um, a professor in Chicago, also at the LSE. Uh, and, and now he's the vice president of Renew Europe. He's also the head of delegation of the Spanish Ciudadanos Party uh, at the European Parliament. And he's pushing for many, many initiatives now in the European debate. So and my role here is going to be only to ask questions. I just want to hear you. And everyone there, thanks very much for joining. I'm, uh, we're going to listen to them, which is the, uh, the important thing today. Uh, and thanks again uh, very much, David, for, for organizing this. Uh, so first question. Um, the the uh, the outlook for the economy looks bad. I'd like to know uh, how bad you think it's going to be. Uh, some some analysts think it's going to look uh, more like the Great Depression. Some others think it's going to be more like the Great Recession. It's uh, definitely different in many ways. Uh, how bad do you expect it to be? Uh, please, uh, Andres, perhaps you could start. Thank you, Tony. Pleasure to be here. Delighted to be uh, joining you and David and Luis uh, to talk about uh, these important and very difficult topics. You asked whether it will be big. I think it will be huge. Um, at the risk of sounding like Donald Trump, it will be huge. Uh, why so big? Because we've had financial crises, debt crises, if you come from a developing world, you, we've had exchange rate crises of all kinds, but we have never had a situation in which the government said to workers, please go home and don't work. And we've never had a situation in which the government said to business owners, 
please close the door, send the workers home, and don't produce anything. And that means that if you just do back of the envelope calculations, the impact on GDP, the impact on employment is going to be tremendous. The big elephant in the room, the big question which Luis and I can speculate on, but nobody can be sure, is how long this will last. If it's very short-lived, I think we have a chance of having a deep recession, but then a quick recovery. However, there are two things that uh, stand in the way of that happy outcome. One is that uh, we have to preserve what one might call employment relationships. You know, a firm is not just a bunch of machines and a bunch of employees. A firm is a bunch of people who've come together, who've been recruited, who've been selected, who've learned to work together. Uh, and a lot of the productive value of a firm is in that combination of human beings. If because of lack of cash, lack of liquidity, you're forced to send those people home, and then six months or a year from now, you say, well, guys, come back, we'll start production again. Many will be gone, many will have another job, maybe many will have moved to a different city or a different country. So the lasting effect on productivity could be gigantic. That's issue one. The other issue, of course, is um, that uh, if a firm has no cash, it may default on its workers, it may also default on its creditors. That means not paying your debts. And it is very easy to envis envision situations in which a productive and employment crisis morphs into a financial crisis. Rich countries, countries with um, powerful central banks, have many ways of avoiding that. And we've been seeing the Fed, the ECB, the Bank of England, doing things that would have sent most academics uh, home with a heart attack just a few months ago, not simply buying government bonds, buying corporate bonds, buying junk corporate bonds. So I think there's a pretty good chance that in Europe and the UK and the US, a full-fledged financial uh, crisis may be averted. The story, and I will say something about the emerging and developing world, the story is much harder and much tougher and potentially much more painful among middle-income countries, let alone low-income countries. First of all, because if you're a middle-class citizen in a middle-class country, you can go home for two months, not make any money, come back, get your paycheck in month three and live with it. If you're a guy who sells candy in the bus or, or on the sidewalk in Mumbai or in Sao Paulo or in Manila, uh, chances are you don't have any savings, you don't have any other sources of income. So if you don't go out and work, you simply don't eat. Secondly, because lots of um, firms in developing countries are informal firms and lots of employment relationships are employment, Government can't step in and say, I will pay your wage for three months because there is no contract. There's no pre-specified wage. Who is the government going to pay? Uh, at what rate is it going to pay? And in addition, lots of emerging countries are suffering from sort of not a double whammy, but a quadruple whammy. There's less demand for their exports uh, from rich countries. The prices of commodities beginning with oil but not ending with oil are in the basement. Some important sources of income, like remittances, say from the US or from Europe, to countries like Mexico or Guatemala or the Philippines, uh, are plummeting. And last but not least, we've seen in the last couple of months the biggest capital outflows that we have ever, ever seen. So if it's going to be big in the rich world, it is going to be bigger probably in the developing world. And here, I'm sure we'll talk about this later, I'll say one sentence about it. Here is where the world community, the international financial community could make a big difference providing financing. My reading of what went on last weekend in the virtual IMF World Bank, World Bank meeting is that lots of nice, sweet, well-meaning things were said, but no tough decisions or few tough decisions were made. And as a result, the financing that is available for many developing countries is very little or at least not enough to meet this gigantic need and I think a lot of human suffering uh, will occur as a result. Let me stop there. Okay, Andres, fantastic. Luis, uh, give, us, give us your views, please. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Um, so, uh, first of all, thanks for the Friedrich uh, Nerman Stichtung and uh, thanks for uh, to Asada for, for having us here. It's really a pleasure and uh, it's really great to, to share a stage with, with Andres. Um, 
I, I agree fully with everything Andres has said. Um, I want to add a little bit of a temporal dimension to what he said. Um, there are two uncertainties on the medical side that are still really, really far from being resolved. And they seem so basic that it's pretty shocking with so many smart scientists the world over working hard at this that we don't, we don't still have them. The first one is how many immune people are there out? How many people actually caught the virus? Today, the Swedes said they think in Stockholm by the 1st of May will have been 600,000. I mean, that is shocking, right? Because there's been very few people dead in Sweden. If there is so many people who have the illness and so, people, so few people dead, first of all, the mortality is much lower than we think. And second, we're closer to immunity than we think. There have been two studies in California today, one in Santa Clara, uh, one other one also in California, I think in LA, that also have found relatively high rates of, 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 uh, of people who have been who had the illness and presumably have and have antibodies and presumably have immunity. So this is huge uncertainty we can't we can't know. The second is um, why um, the the um, uh, how how many people are immune, but how long does the immunity last? That's really a, a key question because if the immunity lasts for two, three years, then we're going to have a wave now and then eventually be immunized for a while, uh, although it's not so long. But if the immunity lasts for months or maybe the carriers are not immune, like uh, in HIV, then are not are, are actually, maybe the immune people, they, the people who have been affected are still carrying, sorry, then we're in trouble. So that's the first issue. If this wave is going to give uh, way to what Tony called today uh, in the newspaper or yesterday, not just to a single peak, but a wave of peaks. Um, and the second is the vaccine. Are we going to have a vaccine and when are we going to have? So those are two issues that are going to tell us how long this is going to last. In the worst scenario, where few people are immune and where the immunity doesn't last very long and we are going back to this kind of situation more times, then the scenario is indeed, as Andres said, catastrophic. Um, in the best scenario, where the illness is now going down because many more people than we think have actually had it, then we could actually see a relatively quick turnaround. So those two variables, immunological variables, that are really in their infancy yet of being known, are crucial. The second thing that I would um, that I would uh, start that I would I would also add in a time dimension is this policy that Andres was describing by the Fed, the Bank of England, the ECB, and the governments of we'll do whatever it takes. We'll just plug as much money, put as much money in the economy as necessary and more. How long can this policy last? I mean, and I would like to hear Andres because this is something Latin America has a lot of experience in. Um, it's a bit of an Argentina policy. We are printing money and not producing goods. I mean, the usual economics view of this is that this ends up, uh, after two, three, four, five months of doing this thing, it ends up in hyperinflation. Of course, now demand is so suppressed, everybody's home. So the main concern economies have is deflation, prices go down because nobody's spending. But as you continue doing this basic money printing, as you continue injecting so much money into the economy without goods to produce, and we move into the fall, if this, if this crisis lasts for sufficiently long, then the big fear from an economic perspective has to be um, that at some point you lose the anchor of the expectations, that people start thinking that prices, that this money doesn't mean anything, that we lose control of the whole monetary system. So I would agree with, with Andres that the situation is, is, is dire economically. I would add these two uncertainties on the immunology side and a question that if the, if the if the crisis lasts for very long, a question about how long can this monetary stimulus and the whole stimulus packages we're putting in the US already two trillion. Um, uh, the, the ECB is right now buying assets at the rate of 38 billion a week. Um, those are those are big big numbers, and and how long can we last doing that? I, I don't know, Andres, if you want to come in and, and, to, and to yeah, just, just just a thought. I am. Um... And like we, I never spent any academic days at the University of Chicago, so I'm a little bit less worried about inflation than, than he is. Um, the, the two guys who get it right, in my view, and you can see their piece in Vox EU, 
are uh, Jean Pisani and Olivier Blanchard, who wrote, wrote a very nice piece in which they, they make a point which I think is valid. Um, money and bonds issued by the government are very different beasts when the interest rate is positive and high. When the interest rate is zero for all practical purposes, whether the UK government issues something called a pound or whether it issues something called a UK government bond, uh, they're both government liabilities. They both carry an interest rate of zero. Um, and what we know is that uh, debt is not inflationary. Uh, money in these circumstances is probably not inflationary either. In fact, 10 years ago, in the middle of the crisis, the Federal Reserve increased its balance sheet by a factor of four, not 4%, four times. And the inflation rate in the US uh, hovered around zero. And in fact, it was negative for short periods of time, uh, as it was in the Eurozone. Now, can you do that again and still remain at very low levels of inflation? I think the answer in the short run is yes. The big question, and uh, Olivier and Jean make this point clearly in their piece, is at some point, a year from now, three years from now, five years from now, the interest rate will have to rise. At that point, bonds or money are not equivalents. People may want to hold onto the bonds and dump the money. And the big question is, what will the government do or the central bank do at that point? One thing they can do is pay interest on reserves, which is what the Fed did, uh, what the Bank of England did, not the ECB. Uh, that's fiscally expensive, but it's perfectly feasible. Uh, and that is a pretty strong way of preventing inflation in the future. So I would not lose much so, over inflation. So, so Andres, let me ask you directly on that. It's nice to disagree. So I, I am also not losing any any sleep over over inflation over over the next uh, very short time. But you must agree that just let's put the case extreme. Everybody staying home month after month. All the checks in the economy, all the wages are coming from the Fed. Uh, in just put in the US, uh, basically from the Treasury, but basically directly financed from the Fed. And mm -hmm. we're not producing anything. At some point, you have to agree that this is not sustainable. I mean, do you think there's really no limit over the November, December, January, February scenarios? No, I, I, I think I will be first to, to admit that I have some sense we can guess what the world looks like if this goes on for three or four months. If it goes on for six or seven, I have no idea. And I worry then not only about the economics, I worry about our people's, you know, people's sanity, people's health. Uh, you know, those who, those of us who have teenagers in the house, you know, whether civil war will break out inside every family, um, many things could go wrong. Um, but one economics thought, um, you, what you're saying is the government is pumping up demand, there's no supply. Um, so what happens to the demand supply balance? That is a valid question, but um, it is also important to remember that while we're home, we're consuming a lot less than we would have been otherwise. You know, I had tickets to go to Italy and got them canceled. I had tickets to the theater, had to cancel them. Uh, I was going out to restaurants with my wife. I'm not longer doing that. So consumption is down. Um, so, uh, you know, savings is going up. And of course our savings yeah. is exactly what the government is tapping to be able to, you know, buy those bonds. So there is a kind of equilibrium there. How long it will last is anybody's guess. Okay, I, I am I am happy to agree with that. There is no question the deflationary shock is there. There's no question we're all spending way, way, way less than we used to. And and that's clearly uh, the first order effect right now is like yeah. there is really, really, really no no uh, no demand and and uh, and, and no uh, and, 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 and and deflation is clearly the, the biggest short run problem. I, I would not disagree with that. Uh, to, to ask, uh, I think it's really interesting what you're saying. Uh, if you, I mean, you can probably freeze the economy for a few weeks. You cannot freeze it forever, uh, and that's that's an issue that you need to think about. Uh, at some point, you need to probably let uh, some companies fall. You have to make very hard decisions from governments, um, and and that's something. I mean, the, the consensus among among doctors is that uh, we'll get this uh, this virus com this virus coming back, right? Uh, uh, and and this is uh, this is really problematic in the medium term. Uh, so uh, why don't you give me uh, your ideas about how, so so basically? And we are uh, here organizing this with the with the Liberal Party. Uh, the for the last 60, 70 years uh, since the since the Second World War, uh, the, the large amounts of progress we have achieved in 
in many ways are related to the globalization and to the free movement of people and goods. Uh, and this is definitely affecting, uh, in many ways, uh, the way uh, probably goods are going to be traded, the way people are going to move. Uh, what are your views on this? Is that, is that change going to be structural? Um, what, what do you think? How, how is this going to, to affect globalization? Luis, why don't you shoot first? I'll follow. Is it, is it now? Um, am I now being heard? So, yes, thank you. I will do that. So, um, my, my, uh, my sense is that we are going to have to adapt to a new normal. Um, I, I don't think the, I mean, and again, we have to rely very strongly on the doctors uh, on this issue. Uh, and, and most people looking at how the cold virus has been evolving over the years, don't think we'll get permanent immunity. We'll have a very nasty, very efficient virus that, that is pretty good at jumping from person to person and is pretty uh, bad in terms of hospital outcomes that we will have to land with for the at least for the next year, a year and a half. What that means is that everything to how we travel in planes, to how we travel in trains, to how we stand in beaches or in uh, uh, our holidays, our restaurants, etc., is going to have to change. And that affects, uh, crucially, a lot of what uh, uh, globalization has achieved. We, I don't think over the next uh, few months uh, and over the foreseeable future, we're going to just be able to jump on a plane and go to another country for the weekend, etc. Um, I think that particularly when you think of what Andres was mentioning about uh, the impact on the third world, if, if, this, if some countries, let's say the Schengen area, manages to contain this, then it's, it's really endemic in, in places, for example, like Africa or like Latin America, you can envision uh, clearly how borders will be closed and people will be told they cannot come from certain places. So I would think that's going to be a first impact in terms of movement of people. But I think there's also a big impact in terms of movement of goods because I think the idea of industrial policy, which was kind of abandoned, it's like old-fashioned, there's just every country specializes in whatever they should, etc., suddenly is back. Now we need industrial policy if we have to be worried about essential supplies getting cut off from us. Do we have to worry about medical supplies? Do we have to worry about electronics? Do we have to worry about certain other things? And that means that I think places like the United States and the European Union are going to have to think strategically about what are the goods that we worry about their supply and what are the goods that we actually think we should have a whole supply chain at home? So I would think that it's very likely uh, that both in the movement of people and the movement of goods, we will see uh, substantive changes as a result of this. I think, and this is certainly not a comment about what Luis said, but it is a comment about what many other people are saying. Uh, there is a risk in this crisis that we engage in confirmation bias, meaning enemies of globalization are saying, yes, of course, this is the end of globalization. People worried about inequality are saying the crisis will deepen inequality. People who worry about X, Y, Z are saying, yeah, I told you, X, Y, Z were going to be an issue. Um, I would be a little bit more careful. Um, I agree with Luis that there are two dimensions in which we will see changes. Clearly, in the mobility of people, we were seeing changes, at least in Europe, long before this crisis, and some of that uh, will continue. Parenthetically, I will I will note, as a, uh, just as a footnote, that um, the, you know the, the flows of people that cause much concern and political crises in Europe are tiny by the kind, you know, compared to the flows of people we're seeing in other parts of, of, of the world. Five million Venezuelans have left Venezuela. Colombia has 1.5 million Venezuelans. Uh, Chile has half a million. Brazil has half a million. Uh, you don't see people on the street having anti-Venezuelan marches. So what, what constitutes uh, a nation's tolerance uh, for immigration clearly varies a great deal. And I think we Latin Americans are finding that we're surprisingly tolerant, more so than other nations in other latitudes. Uh, I think it is also true that um, partially because of COVID and partially because of environmental concerns, uh, we will have more meetings on Zoom. Uh, we will have fewer meetings uh, after flying for 18 hours to sit in a room with partners for three hours. Um, 
I am finding having lots of meetings on Zoom is very pleasant. I can I can take a walk and 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 talk to my children between meeting and meeting. It's not really that bad. But I don't think going from those two examples to a more general proposition, I don't think this is the death knell of trade, uh, of uh, the movement of services, and certainly not of all the other things that globalization um, entails. Uh, I suspect that um, people in Britain may be very fond of uh, British cheese, but they will continue to covet French and Italian and Spanish cheese, and they will continue to buy that. Uh, and where essential or strategic supplies are concerned, yes, I think we may see a bit more government intervention. Um, but I think the firms themselves will begin to look at uh, making supply chains more secure. I was talking to uh, an official in the Mexican government recently, and he said, this is a great opportunity for Mexico. Mexico is next, next door to the US. Many big American firms have moved production of components to China or to Vietnam or to Indonesia. That's a world away. Uh, not all production that used to be in China will come to Mexico, but maybe American firms will say, uh, I'll, I'll manufacture 20% in Mexico just to make sure that I have it nearby uh, in case of an emergency, whether it be a virus or an earthquake or a national security emergency uh, or what have you. So more than a zero sum game in which, um, or sorry, more than a zero one uh, black and white situation in which is all globalization, no globalization. I think you may have a reshuffling of globalizations in which there are some winners and there are some losers, but I'm pretty sure we will continue to trade. Now, when I talk about the politics of all, I, I imagine we're going to talk about politics in a minute. Uh, whatever happens with the real trade, uh, something that is very important is what is the narrative that emerges from this? Because even if trade continues to happen, uh, you know, last time around, uh, the narrative that um, that became dominant after the crisis is, you know, Wall Street got a bailout, Main Street uh, got very little. And so we have to worry about what is said and how this is all processed. And I think a lot remains to be said, or at least a lot remains to be understood in that dimension. If I can, if I can add, uh, something, if you allow me um, to 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 add something. Uh, uh, so so I was I was trying to talk in the world of what is uh, what I expect to be not uh, the positive world, not the normative world of what I would actually want to see. I think trade, I agree with Andreas that trade will remain as important as ever, that we actually want a lot of trade. I mean, we don't want uh, suddenly all these countries in the third world, in the developing countries that have come out of poverty by having the possibility of trading with the West to suddenly be locked out of these markets and to really fall back into poverty. So we have to make an effort, I think, uh, the friends of markets and of uh, and of the prosperity of humanity to push back against the forces that will try to use this to, to close borders. Um, I think that this statement of what, of what should happen um, doesn't stop me from thinking that a lot of what will happen in, in movement of goods and people will be, will be backwards. <clears throat> uh, so, yeah, continuing with what you say, I, I find really relevant the, the debate as regards to what's going to happen with populism and nationalism, which is very related to what you were saying, right? Just before uh, this, this crisis, both of you wrote uh, wonderful books on, on uh, what, what's going to happen to the future of liberal democracy, the challenge of populism, etc. Um, here there are different views, right? So we see, on the one hand, um, some people that think that uh, perhaps this is going to be good, uh, to fight populism because then we will have uh, more support for democratic and for people that are actually serious in managing uh, public policy. Um, but some other thing, look, now we're going to get back to nationalism uh, and, and uh, the scapegoat of uh, whatever virus that comes from China, etc., is going to be is going to be there again. So, what are your views on that? Are we going to go towards uh, increasing nas nationalism and populism? Mm -hmm. or go towards less of that, Andres? Great question. Let me tell you which view I think is wrong, and then I will try to guess what view may be right. There was a popular view a few weeks ago that went like this. 
populist leaders, think of Trump in the US, think of Bolsonaro in Brazil, think of uh, Lopez Obrador in Mexico, maybe to some extent uh, Boris Johnson in the UK, although he's certainly not in the league of the other three. Uh, maybe these guys are bungling the crisis. Uh, clearly in the case of Trump, his management has been incompetent, uh, out of touch, uh, lots of other things. So the view was these guys are going to do so badly and Democrats are going to do much better. As a result, liberal Democrats will look good and the populists will look bad. I don't think that's necessarily the case, uh, among other things, because lots of other authoritarian regimes, maybe not populistic, but clearly non-democratic, are doing quite well. Think of China, think of Singapore. Um, and needless to say, there are plenty of Western democracies which are not governed by populists, where nonetheless the management of the crisis has not been so great. I can think of several Western Euro European countries that fall under that category. So my first point is we should not simply sit, um, you know, have a drink and expect that because they are bungling incompetence, the populace will be booted out. That would be way too optimistic, way too complacent. Now, um, I think what will really make a difference is whether coming out of this crisis, the populations feel that it was hard, we suffered, but we were all in it together, uh, as opposed to once again, some people got a privilege, some people got an easy ride, others did not. If, you know, I'm, I'm speaking from West London right now, and I've been talking to lots of my English friends about London today compared to London in 1940. You know, the city was locked down back then, the city is locked down today. And what many English historians say, I'm reading a great book uh, about London during the war, is that the sense of national unity and national purpose that has been very clear in the UK for the last 40 years, even during some pretty bad economic times in the 60s and 70s, came from the fact that the war was terrible, but the British stood shoulder to shoulder, uh, and they defeated the fascists, they defeated the Nazis, and the rich guy from Oxford and the poor kid from uh, a mining town, both were in the same trench fighting the same enemy. If Western countries can come out of this crisis in the spirit in which people, you know, applaud the NHS every Thursday night in London, or in the spirit in which people in Barcelona or Madrid uh, applaud health workers, or in New York, they do exactly the same thing, and people uh, clap uh, to show respect for first respondents. In that sense, I think the institutions of liberal democratic government will have been strengthened. They will be viewed as they work for us. They don't necessarily just work for them. But I can also imagine an outcome which is not 1945. It looks more like 2010, in which people say there are these academics and these uh, lawyers and these professionals who are sitting in their comfortable, comfortable apartments and they keep working from home and they keep getting paychecks. And I, I work in a pizza parlor and the pizza parlor is closed and I can't do my job and I'm not getting paid. So society again fragments into many identities and some identities feel disrespected and mistreated by other people. Uh, in which case, almost regardless of public policy, uh, the institution of government and the institution of liberal democracy will come out a little shaken. Which one of the two will it be? I think, as I say, in the United States, the jury is still out, but we will know pretty soon. Luis, I know you have no ideas on these if you, if you want to develop them. Yes, I, I am. I am. I am. Uh, uh, I am happy to to address this. So, um, there is something strange. Uh, it's probably coincidence. I don't want to do a very small n analysis, but <laughs> in the fact that the U.S., the U.K., Spain, in Italy, um, which are the countries that, to me, from the outside, seem to be basically bungling the uh, or or at least appear to be less effective, let me put it like this, are the countries that have seen uh, populism and polarization corrode uh, their administration most. In the US, we see a president who is basically um, 
doing politics with everything. Uh, all the discussion is partisan. The governors, the, the decisions to leave or not to leave the house, the decision to do quarantine or not, every single decision is political. In the UK, we, we see a civil service that was very weakened and a government that was very weakened by the Brexit debate and, and a very big growth of populism. In Spain, we've seen government deteriorating over the last uh, years and we've seen that in Italy with a very big growth of populism and a very also kind of uh, loss of inefficiency of the state. This crisis is very much about state capabilities. That states that the state, or appears to be very much about state capabilities, the state that work, and the, the, the Germanies of the world, etc., seem to implement testing. They do hundreds of thousands. I think Germany is doing 600,000 tests a week. They do lots of tests. They, uh, they seem to control, to act early. They seem to figure out what's going on. They seem to have good information. And countries like the four I mentioned that have seen uh, biggest weakening uh, by populism seem to be less effective. Now, my the way I would like the reaction of, of public opinion to be would be towards efficient government, not towards big government or small government, but we need good government. We need administration that is well paid, uh, good civil service, politicians that are well prepared. We need a very uh, a, a political class that is able to come together and not look for silly reasons to polarize. I, 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 I always kind of have to think of the Tuesday last week, the 14th or, or, or Wednesday, whenever it was, the 14th of, 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 of April was the um, anniversary of, this, of the Second Republic. In a moment where we need people to come together, where we need to be sending a message of unity, of we, we're going to beat this together, a vice prime minister of this country spends the whole day tweeting against the head of state and the fact that he wore a military uniform, etc. That's divisive, that weakens the response, that loses cohesion, and, and that's exactly what we don't need. So my sense is that there is a, a, a much better response. I mean, it's really early days to say it, okay? And I, I realize um, I don't have a big regression to say it, but I think there's a better response from the countries that have more cohesive governments, more professional administrations, less weakened by populism. And I hope that the response by people is, we need governments like that. I like that optimism. Let me add one thing. I, I think this is absolutely right. It is not a coincidence that countries, now there, there are two viruses at work here. One is called COVID-19, the other virus is called populism and demagoguery. Uh, they're both contagious and they're both nasty. And Luis is absolutely right. Countries in which the virus of demagoguery uh, has been present and strong are countries that are bungling the response. No question about that. I guess my doubt is that bungling the response is one thing, getting punished politically for bungling the response is another thing, because at a time of um, hugely polarized politics, at a time in which Americans choose the radio station or the television station or the website they visit mostly because it confirms their own biases. You know, Trump is going to run a political campaign in the autumn in which he will um, blame the virus on the Chinese. And there will be people who say, of course, it's the, the, the fault of the Chinese. So in the time of the two viruses, of the twin viruses, populism can twist politics and can twist truth in very dangerous ways. So whether the inept governments will get punished at the polls for being inept is what I'm not entirely sure about. I wish it, it were the case. I wish I could say yes, but uh, we've seen so many nasty things happen at the polls in recent years that I've learned to be a little bit skeptical. Very, very interesting. Uh, I would like to ask you a million questions, but uh, let, let me, uh, to follow up what you were saying, Andres, uh, in relation to, to how the crisis will hit probably uh, differently uh, different sectors. Um, so th there are a number of potential rising inequalities, right? So there, there are divisions between temporary workers and permanent workers. There are regional divisions between urban and rural, uh, even, even gender divisions in, in how the crisis is affecting uh, people. Uh, also intergenerational divisions. Uh, so we see um, uh, the, the elderly who are suddenly uh, more affected by the virus, but in, in a way also more protected socially. Mm -hmm. uh, 
the young people that were already in a, in a terrible situation before that, right? Uh, so uh, how do you think the inequality, the inequality story will, will affect uh, politics and, and how do you think we, we can change that or we can, or we can influence uh, to mi minimize in the best possible way the, the inequalities that are rising? Luis, you want to jump first? No, I'm, I'll go second this time. I love okay, happy inequality. I worry about three kinds of inequality. And of course, the list is long. In many countries of the West, in Europe, North America, there's been the growing perception that the world is divided between the citizens of everywhere uh, 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 and the citizens of somewhere. Uh, the citizens of everywhere are people who you know, do um, virtual webinars like this one and, 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 and the language uh, of the world, which is English, who can work from home, whose incomes are fairly well protected across the economic cycle and uh, fairly well protected from pandemics. Um, and the citizens of somewhere are the people who work at the pizza parlor or at the factory or at the local beauty parlor and who today can't work. They have a little bit of insurance from the government, but that insurance may not be enough or may not last. Uh, and if that perception of society um, split between white collar and blue collar, between cosmopolitan cities, citizens and cities, uh, citizens of small towns uh, and faraway places, that division is likely to be deepened by this crisis. Whether the pocketbook will actually show those numbers to be what I'm suggesting is important, but uh, it is not of, of, of the essence. But the perception, I think, will be that some groups got a lucky break, some groups didn't. Secondly, you point out, Tony, something that is politically incorrect to mention, but which happens to be very true. Um, in most countries, uh, senior citizens vote more than the young. As a result, governments spend more per capita, a great deal more on pensions than on daycare uh, or education. Uh, and one could argue that young people are the big victims of this uh, situation because young people uh, have very low risk of, of death from, uh, from contagion and therefore they could be out working uh, and they're being kept from work uh, because um, of the lockdown, which is uniform across uh, all ages. Um, and again, in countries with weak pension systems, in countries in which, in which people may be asked to pay more taxes in the future, uh, to finance uh, pensions, which are probably unsustainable, that will be uh, a nasty issue. Again, not a new one, but a nasty, a nasty issue indeed. Last but not least, let me spend a minute on, um, on the uh, divisions between the advanced countries and the emerging countries. Um, Emerging countries today account for 50% of world GDP. So it is in the interest of rich countries uh, that emerging countries do well on at least two sets of grounds. First of all, contagion. After all, the virus came from China. And if the virus remains alive in many other nations outside North America and Western Europe, it will come back for a second, third or fourth wave. But in addition to that, most firms in Europe and the US today need the market that is China or India or Brazil or Mexico or Turkey or Poland or South Africa. Um, there will be no fashion industry in, in, in Europe without China within the Middle East, to give you one example. And as a result, if the emerging markets tank in years to come, everybody, emerging market citizens first, but rich country citizens as well are going to pay a price. What's the difference in the world rates of growth between now and the previous crisis? 10 years ago, even in the worst year, that was 2008, I think, the world kept growing ever so slightly because Europe and the US and Japan came down very sharply, but China, India, Poland, Turkey kept on growing. And as a result, the world rate of growth was positive very slightly, but positive. If you believe the IMF, this year, uh, the world rate of growth is going to be minus three. And, and that's partially because the rich countries are going to tank, but also because China is posing the, the first uh, negative growth ever. 
uh, and the virus really has not hit most countries in Asia, most countries in Africa yet. So you could have um, a situation in which because of structural reasons, because of low incomes, because of weaker states, as Luis was saying, truly a devastating situation, both in emerging markets and especially in low income countries. You know, if the, you know, in Latin America, I can think of serious problems in Peru or, 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 or Mexico or Brazil or Chile, but these are upper middle income countries. Uh, once you go to low income countries, think about Central America, think about Haiti, think about the rest of the Caribbean, think about Bolivia, uh, the combination of lost export revenues, capital outflows, very weak states, very limited medical capacity, uh, we're talking about potential deaths in the millions, in the millions. And as a result, uh, when you talk about inequality, when you talk about lasting scars and nasty political repercussions, that's one element we simply cannot forget. Very uh, the, the, I will, I will, I will, what I'll do is I was just hearing uh, Andres and, and, and I will use basically his same division on three categories and, and just kind of use different uh, use it on, on different in different ways but just to keep to keep the analysis similar um i agree on the income um there is a huge the biggest gap in this crisis is between those who can work at home and those who can't i bet the three of us have had a more productive month in the last month than probably any other month in the last few years i've, I've probably I've not had wasted meetings, uh, tri trips that I have to do a lot with uh, being MEP. I have to go back to Brussels and Strasbourg and Madrid and uh, all the time. I haven't wasted time in meetings. I, haven't, I have basically been working seven days a week, morning to night, very well. I haven't lost a minute of, of activity. So the difference between working those who can work at home and those who can't is a difference that is going to affect information workers that were already helped by the information revolution evolution versus the rest. So that's something that goes in the same direction as past changes. But there is one thing that I think is, is important uh, that is very different. In the past, uh, let's say in the 1990s, when you would ask any of us, what do you think the internet will do? And we, we think it will go against big cities and in favor of rural areas because people will want to move and live in a beautiful place in the middle of nowhere rather than be in a city. That didn't happen. The internet helped cities because people wanted to bump on each other and creative types want to be together with other creative types. Now, this one is different, in my opinion. I think that the attractiveness of a city, when you cannot go to a restaurant, to a bar, to a museum, to the concert, to a walk, blah, blah, versus living in a little town or in a village where you can just walk around in the mountains, um, if you can get internet and you want to work at home, I think rural versus urban is maybe one uh, vector of inequality that is going to go in a different direction in the past. Rural is going to actually benefit potentially. Uh, agriculture also, but also a primary sector, but also just simply living out of the big towns. On demographics, yeah. I, wanted to add, I wanted to add something. I agree totally with what Andres said about young versus old. I want to add a thought simply on the people who are between 30 and 40 today. Those are people who came out of university in the crisis or of high school in the crisis, who had a few very, very hard years, who have seen situation just improving from, let's say, 2015-16, who've started to get more steady jobs. Remember, in Spain, we had 14% unemployment still. And this same generation now is 38, 36, 40, and is getting hit by a second blow. I think that that is a generation that is going to suffer most. They haven't been able to accumulate assets. And when we do policy, we have to think of that generation. And third, geographically. I don't want to make a distinction north-south that, uh, that uh, was so well done by Andres, but I want to make a distinction north-south inside the European Union. Um, by a mix of bad luck and bad government, the worst countries hit in the European Union have been the ones with higher debt and most hit by the 2008 crisis, Spain and Italy. The geographic tensions inside the European Union are going to be very, very big and are going to have potentially very difficult consequences for you. Um, I'll leave it at that because it's, it's time and I can't, I can't spend too, too much more. No, I think, I think we still have time for one or two more questions. Uh, we've been uh, about 50 minutes. And I'm going to try to collect a couple of ideas of all the people that are following us from uh, through, through LinkedIn and, and YouTube. Uh, one, one, one relevant question and, and connected to what you were saying, Luis, and I would like to hear both of you talking about this. One of the big challenges 
uh, who's been extremely connected to this, obviously, as an MEP, uh, is uh, what's going to happen with the, with the euro. Um, you were saying the, the pile of debt in the south uh, is going to be perhaps more problematic than the pile of debt in the north. Uh, we already had a lot of, of debt, and if interest rates go up, uh, we will uh, probably end up in a very complicated situation for uh, some countries in the south and also for the Eurozone. There are many things moving on. Uh, it's incredible. I think I'm, many of us are surprised, uh, are surprised about how good uh, the EU is reacting in, in some ways. The ECB has been ambitious, the Commission as well. Luis, why don't you give us uh, so your views, uh, and Andres probably on, on, on that also from uh, the standing of, obviously, of, of financial markets, etc. If you want to give us your view also on, on the on the eurozone and, and the, future, the future of europe and probably we close it we close it there uh thank you tony um i would i would say uh the eurozone is is very vulnerable it has never been so vulnerable the key point of vulnerability is obviously italy i had a chat with luigi zingales two weeks ago uh on a on a podcast like this uh, which people can find online in which Luigi said something that really shocked me. He said the difference between Italy and Greece, I'm paraphrasing, Greece didn't have any outside options, Italy does. And his view was, I don't know if this is true, I think this is, his view was if Italy doesn't see sufficient support from the European Union, it has an outside option. And the outside option is China. He said at this moment in time, you ask people to stay at home, so there's no bank panics, people just stay because you're doing some extra care. You can have a huge loan from China. You can shift the geopolitical orientation of Italy from Europe to China in a fortnight if you are a populist government, Salvini, somebody like that. Mm -hmm. And we know how crazy some of the people working uh, in there in the Lega are. So the risk to Europe right now is really existential. I agree with you that there have been many steps that have been given. Already all the three layers of insurance agreed by Eurogroup for workers with the shore, by for, for firms uh, with the with the BI, B, European Investment Bank, and for states with the uh, ESM, plus the money from the ECB, are going to ensure that we can continue viable. Uh, people can borrow and people can can continue being liquid for 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 the medium for the short for the short term. If this crisis lasts, if this if this help is not enough. Um, if if there is a huge debt overhang that makes it very hard for Italy to grow, um, I think everything is possible. I really hope that tomorrow there is a council, by a European Council and heads of state, etc., uh, and government. I hope that 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 Europe continues in this good path that has started a couple of weeks ago. Andres, if you want to give us your concluding remark, yeah. I mean, just on on the eurozone, I've I've never been a big fan of the euro, uh, Luis knows this, um, for, you know, I've been writing about exchanges all my life and I've always had a hard time thinking of Europe's exchange or arrangements as making a great deal of sense, but there they are, we're not going to get rid of them. Um, but I think in retrospect, you know, 10 years ago or eight years ago, uh, the Eurozone came about, you know, this close to being undone. Um, I was in Athens several times during the crisis, so, I know exactly, and talking to policymakers there, I know exactly how close uh, um, uh, Athens came. And of course, the Greeks didn't do it for the reason that uh, Luis has mentioned. Um, you know, they had no place to go. Um, um, now, whether whether China is or not an alternative, um, I, it could be. I guess all I can add to this is, in my part of the world, a few countries have gone to China for to you know for emergency loans. Um, they have found China to be, <clears throat> how shall we put it, a fairly demanding taskmaster when you are um, you know, indebted to China. And parenthetically, a fascinating uh, issue that is going to uh, crop up now is in the World Bank IMF meeting last week, uh, one of the agreements was to, was to seek relief, uh, debt relief for, for lot, lots of countries. Well, it used to be that when it came to official debt, it was all, you know, the UK, the US, the Scandinavians, you know, the European Union. It turns out that one of the biggest creditors uh, today is China. Uh, but China, of course, not a member of the Paris Club. So I think it's going to be fascinating, and maybe the Italians will be looking to learn from this, 
you know, whether when you get into trouble, China says, oh, bygones are bygones, I'm willing to forgive half of your debt, or whether China says, no way, maybe the Europeans and the Americans will forget uh, about your debt, but we Chinese will not. Um, nobody has any clue. China has made no, uh, no uh, sounds on this, but China will be under a great deal of pressure to engage in debt forgiveness vis-a-vis -vis Africa, South Asia, Central America, the Caribbean, etc. Um, so maybe the Italians will have good news. Uh, maybe the Italians will have bad news. Who knows? I suspect the news will be pretty bad on that, on that front. Thanks so much, uh, Luis. Andres. It's been fascinating to to hear you both. Both. I think Luis needs to leave uh, already uh, for another meeting. Uh, thank you, everyone, for following us. Thanks, uh, the Frederick Naumann Foundation, uh, for for uh, bringing about this initiative. Uh, and thanks to all. I hope uh, I'll see you. I'll see you very soon. Very good. Thank you, David. Thank you, Andres. Thank you, Tony. It was really a great, a great chat. My great. real pleasure and honor. Let's do it again. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.